Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in the Ask Good webinar series. We're very excited today as we have presentations from three organizations from outside of academia who have or are using Ask Good in their organizations. So to start off, we've got Gemma and his Dawson from Positive Futures, um, which is a provider from Northern Ireland. And Gemma will talk about how Ask Good was used to evaluate Life I Want program. The second presentation will be given jointly by Trisha Capes of Essex County Council and Brian Goodwin of Community Agents Essex, and they will talk about how ASCOT was used in the Community Agent program. And lastly, Julie York and Phil Benson from Community Integrated Care, which is a national service provider, will talk about um, how ASCOT is going to be used in their organization. So the speakers are presenting remotely from different locations across the country, so please bear with us if there are any, any delays at all. And I'm going to hand over to Ed, our computing officer, who will explain some technical um, information now. So Ed, over to you. Hi everyone. Um, just to say, we're going to go through the presentations in the order Camilla just said. At the end of each presentation we'll take questions. So either use the question window in the GoToMeeting software to send in your questions and then we'll come to you at the end or at the end you can press the little hand up button put your hand up and then we'll unmute you one by one and you can ask the question directly to the presenter um, like Camilla said please bear with us if there are any technical problems it's the first time we've done this with speakers all over the country um, but hopefully it'll all go okay um, so now Oh, and finally, we are recording this session. Um, if anyone has any objections to that, please let us know, but we hope to make it available on the ASCOT website in due course. Um, so for now, I will hand over to Gemma, who is going to give the first presentation. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone, and um, thank you very much to the ASCOT team for um, providing us with the opportunity to share our experience of, of using ASCOT as a service provider. Um, my name is Gemma and I work for an organisation based in Northern Ireland called Positive Futures. Um, we're a charity organisation and I am the project manager for a project called The Life I Want, um, which I'm going to share a little bit um, more about with you today. So just to give a bit of an overview um, of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to start with giving you some background information about Positive Futures and who we are and what we do tell you a little bit about our project um, called The Life I Want, why we chose ASCOT to evaluate the impact of this project and, and how we used the tool and finally what our findings were. So just a bit of background about Positive Futures then. So Positive Futures are a charity organisation um, and we provide support to people with a learning disability, those with acquired brain injury and people on the autistic spectrum and their families. So we have quite a range of services available, um, including supported living services, um, so giving people the opportunity to live where and how they choose. We would have peripatetic housing support um, for people who have their own tenancy. We have um, a short break respite service, which provides an opportunity for people to spend time away from their families, gain independent skills and provide carers um, with a break from their loved ones. We also have a shared live service which gives adults the opportunity um, to live with and be supported by another family or individual for a short or long term period of time. And we also have family support services which provide support for the whole family and opportunities for children and young people to become more involved in the community. So they would be our, our main um, core services and then on top of that we would have individual uh, projects as well. And one of those projects would be the Life by One project. And this is the project that I want to, to share some information with you about today. So this project is currently being rolled out within our supported living services, but we are beginning to address how this concept um, fits with the other services that we provide. Just to give you a bit of a broader context um, about Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland are at the beginning of, a, of our personalisation journey um, and we've just started to introduce the vision of self-directed support across our health trusts with the aim of giving people we support um, who use social care services greater choice, control and flexibility over their support needs. However, um, this, as I said, this is relatively new in Northern Ireland and is, is just starting to be rolled out now. 
in the absence of self-directed support, um, if the traditional model would be if you required social care support, the trust would choose and arrange services for you. So at Positive Futures, we wanted to ensure that, um, firstly, that we were going to be ready for the introduction of self-directed support in Northern Ireland, but also in its absence, um, we wanted to make sure that, that the people that we supported on a daily basis had choice, control and flexibility with the support that we provided. So in order to do that, we have been working with Helen Sanderson's Associates um, for well over 10 years now, and we began to develop um, this project, The Life I Want. Um, once we got to, to this point, which is the graphic that you see on the screen now, this is really our, our holy grail is what we termed it. And this is the process that outlines what our personalization journey is. I'll talk you a little bit through the, the image that you see on the screen. So, as I said, Positive Futures are a person-centred organisation um, and in order to truly understand the people that we support, we would use a range of person-centred tools in, in order to um, get to know the person better. So we take all these person-centred tools and we formulate them into what we call a person-centred portfolio. So each of the people we support would have a person-centred portfolio so that we know um, how best to support them both now and, and what their future hopes and dreams are, so how we can help support them in the future. So as part of the Life I Want, we took that information as a starting point and we then had a facilitated event called Planning Live. And Planning Live is generally a one day or two day facilitated event where we bring together the person that we support's core support circle. So that may be the person's family, it could be their social worker, um, any other professionals that's involved um, with the person. It would be their core support staff. And we bring everybody together into a room and we have a facilitated event. So it's a very, very informal day. And we use a range of person-centered tools in order to formulate outcomes and a perfect week. So we look at um, what's working in the person's life, what's not working, and what they want to change about their life. And we formulate that into, if you could have a perfect week, what, what would that look like for you? We then set some outcomes around that, so some person-centered outcomes um, that the person wants to achieve, and we make sure that, that they marry up with the perfect week. We then have a second facilitated event, which we call Just Enough Support, and this is really the how. So how are we going to work towards these person-centered outcomes, and how are we going to deliver um, the support that the person needs, both, both now and in the future? So when we look at um, Just Enough Support, we want to look at paid staff as a, the last option. So how can we support that person to have um, more friends, family and, and community involvement? Um, is there a role that volunteers could play? Um, what about assistive technology? Could that support the person to become more independent? And then what do we need to do as paid staff or an organisation? Is there anything that we need to do within our practices differently in order to give that person more choice, control and flexibility of their support? So we then formulate that into a personalised support planner, which is um, really a shift planner um, as to how we're going to deliver the support that the person needs. And then this is all reviewed through our person-centred review process. As part of our person-centred review process, then you'll see we have a, a little um, cloud there which says outcome measures, and the outcome measures that we have used there is ASCOT. So we're, everything's going back into the review process, so it's, it's not um, any additional processes, and then the cycle starts again um, with the exclusion of planning life and just enough support events in the future. So obviously, um, evaluating the impact of projects and services is, is really important. And by focusing on outcomes and measuring impact, we're provided with a clearer picture of what we need to focus on and, and what we need to do, how we can improve our services and, and the direction that we want um, to move our organisation in. In order to, to support the change that we're rolling out, we wanted to be able to demonstrate that we were making a positive change to the lives of the people we support. So we wanted to know, that does this process, does the life I want have a positive impact on the lives of the people we support? And we really needed a tool that was going to be easy to use. It needed to, to fit into our existing practices, so we didn't want it to be an additional workload. It would most likely be um, a senior support worker or a person's key worker who was going to be um, evaluating this, so we wanted it to be able to fit in with their practices. It needed to be adaptable. We support a, a very broad range of individuals with varying levels of need. So some of the people we support would be very, very articulate, have very good verbal communication, could tell us exactly um, how and, and what way they would want their life to be, whereas others um, 
wouldn't have any verbal communication, maybe didn't have the capacity. And at, at that stage, we, we needed to, to look at how we were going to have a tool that could be adaptable to meet the needs of, of that cohort of people as well. And we also wanted the tool to be able to, to provide us direction so that we knew what areas um, we need to improve within our services for the people that we support. So we looked at quite a range of tools um, and we considered some of the tools that we considered were the goal attainment scale. Um, I'm not going to go through what each of these tools are, otherwise um, it will be a very long presentation. Um, but the goal attainment scale, really it was it was became very difficult for us. It would have been um, very person-centered, which is fantastic, but each individual would have had maybe numerous um, goal attainment skills to achieve. Um, so it would have been difficult and we couldn't have aggregated the data. We also looked at the Life Star then, um, so as I'm sure lots of people are familiar with the Outcome Stars. Um, and one of the advantages of it was that it could be used um, to measure journey of change for people with a learning disability. However, some of the challenges around that were licensing fees. Um, it could be quite costly depending on the number of, of users. And we were also concerned maybe about ceiling effects and whether actually the, the outcomes that were gathered through the Lifestar actually fitted with, with our needs and fitted in with the Life I Want project. We also looked at um, POET, or the Personal Budgets Outcome Evaluation Tool. Um, and this is a tool that's really used to measure the impact of personal budgets on people's lives. Because we were rolling this without, within our supported living services, um, only a very small percentage of the people we support used a personal budget, so this tool wasn't really going to be feasible for us either. And we also looked then at the Health Equality Framework, um, which measures services effective effectiveness in tackling health inequalities for people with a learning disability and one of the weaknesses was that with this tool was that it appeared to be very much a staff tool and um, with little or no input from the, the person supported um, required. So we then eventually came across um, ASCOT and had felt that this tool had met our needs. Um, we thought in terms of our staff it was going to be very easy to use we thought we could incorporate it into everyday practice um, in terms of monitoring and, and review processes. The information was easy to record and um, we found the Excel documents where we just inputted the data into extremely useful. The results were, were instantaneous, they were instant results um, and they very easy to interpret with the visual findings so um, particularly the web um, diagram at the end was very easy for our staff to interpret and, and to be able to see what areas that we may need to to invest um, a bit more time in. And also, um, we use the ASCOT interview board version. So in the absence of um, an easy read version for people with learning disabilities, we meant we, with the aid of an interview, we were able to specify the type of service that we were, were talking about or with the care that we were talking about. For the people we supported, again, um, you know, with the aid of the interviewer, um, it provided a much more easier means for them to understand what the questions were and what we were asking of. Um, it also gave an opportunity to share elements of what wasn't working with them. And um, then in terms of future planning, we were able to identify actions um, to improve domain saving to better quality of life. From a provider perspective, um, clearly identified areas where change was needed, so the domains were, were very useful for us. The illustrative data was very easy to interpret, and for us, we have eight supported living services across Northern Ireland. Um, so we were able to look at the data at an individual level for the person supported, look at it as a service level, um, dependent on area, and then we were able to aggregate the data as well across the organisation, so it gave us a really good understanding and there was lots that we could do with, with the data that we collected. So as I said, we used the ASCOT interview for a version. Um, prior to using it then, we also had agreed how we could use the tool with people we support who couldn't verbally communicate responses or who didn't have the capacity to complete the tool. And what we had decided to do was again taking a very person-centred approach, using um, person-centred tools and taking the approach similar to be used during a live planning event where we brought together the person support circle, um, again friends, family, um, core support staff, and they would have completed the tool um, on behalf of the person supported. How they would have completed the tool now, they also would have looked at to make sure that person's voice um, was coming through and that the person's kept the centre. We would have looked at some of the um, person-centred tools that we use. So, for example, we use communication charts 
Um, so we knew how if the person um, was happy with something, what their nonverbal cues were, um, or how they communicated. And we used that information then, along with each person's individual knowledge, to to decide what the answers were on, on that person's behalf. We also trained um, the key workers and our service managers on how to use the tool. And, and basically, that training was very, very simple. We took the, the guidance document, which was very comprehensive, and we practiced how the interviews should be conducted um, with the people that we support. We had 68 people we support through our supported living services who completed the tool, and we used data for 67 people. Um, all 68 people did complete um, the ASCOT uh, questions, but what we found was that if one question was left out, it didn't aggregate a social care related quality of life score at the end, and, and that's why we ended up um, losing data for one individual. 41 people who completed the questions and um, completed them with, with support from the interviewer, as, it, as the guidance suggests, and 26 individuals' responses were discussed and agreed by the person's core support circle. So 20 of the 67 people then, um, also included in the analysis of the data, had completed the Life I Want strategy. Um, we then uh, had an average social care related um, quality of life score collected for each supported living service. And then we also um, collated all the data to provide an aggregate social care related um, quality of life score for all individuals supported across each of the eight supported living services. Um, so just a bit of background on the interpretation of the score. I'm sure um, everybody knows this. Um, ASCOT social care related quality of life scores range from um, minus 0.17 to 1. Um, any score less than zero indicates the person considers themselves to be in, in quite a poor state of, of living. One is um, considered as an ideal state, so by the person's expectation, the individual's wishes and preferences are being fully met. And a low um, score indicates increased need in one or more of the domains. So a score of 0.17 would indicate that the individual has some needs across all domains. So what were our findings then? Um, so we had an aggregate mean social care related quality of life score for the people we support by positive futures of 0.88. Um, thankfully, no one um, was considered to be in, in a state worse than death. And the scores um, on the social care related quality of life score were skewed towards the higher end. So 51 out of the 67 people that um, completed the um, questionnaire scored better than the average, which was the mean of 0.88. So again, um, you can see the, the spider diagram on your screen, and our main areas where, where we feel that we need to improve our services are, are really very clearly apparent there um, in terms of control, occupation, and social. In terms of the small gaps around accommodation, cleanliness, food and drink, and safety, these were really um, individual cases of so small numbers of people, maybe one um, or two people in, in each of those domains. So we were able to actually work out who those people were um, and then go back and, and find out what the, the issues were for that person and, and put actions in place to try to um, resolve those. So again, just um, looking at the needs then, um, the results of the survey show us that there were some areas in People We Support's lives where they reported that all their wishes and preferences were not being fully met. Um, so 27% of the People We Support said that their social needs were not being fully met. They want to be more involved in the community and develop meaningful, meaningful relationships. 24% of those who completed the survey indicated their occupational needs were not being met. And people wanted to have more meaningful activities such as get a job, do unpaid work or, or care for others. People also want to be able to choose what they want to do and when they want to do it. And 18% of the people who completed our survey reported their preferences and wishes to enable them to have control over their lives were, again, were not being fully met. Those percentages um, just incorporated people with some needs, incorporated the data for some needs and high needs. Um, obviously, there's the, the no needs state, which we didn't um, include in, in those uh, percentages there. But again, no needs isn't fully meeting the, the person's preferences or wishes. Um, so maybe that's something that we need to look at further down the line. So what what we did then was we divided the data out, um, so we looked at the individuals who had completed the Life I Want strategy, and we looked at individuals who had not yet gone through the Life I Want processes. And what we had found was that overall individuals who had completed the Life I Want strategy reported a higher social care related quality of life score 
than individuals who had not yet completed um, the Life I Want. So 60% um, of the people who have completed the Life I Want told us that their social needs were now being met compared to 40% of those who hadn't completed the process. 60% of the people who completed the Life I Want reported their occupational needs were being met compared to 43% of those who hadn't completed the process. And 55% of the people um, who completed the Life I Want reported their control needs were now being met compared to 40% um, who haven't completed the process. So this was really good for us. It gave us a good um, clear indication that the Life I Want strategy is having a positive impact on the quality of life of, of people we support, and particularly um, in those domains of social control and occupation where, where we, we felt that we really needed to improve. We didn't. Um, we can't obviously conclude a causal effect because we, we didn't do any statistical analysis on the data. Um, so again, that's something that we would maybe need to look at down the line. So what has, has having an, an outcomes approach meant for us? Um, so again, just back to the data, the three main areas that we felt that we could improve people's lives were social participation, involvement, control and occupation. Um, we were very, very lucky. There was a, a funding grant came out um, from the Social Work Innovation Fund, and some money, some money became available. And one of the areas that we thought we needed to improve was was obviously the social participation and involvement. And we were able to use the data that we collected from um, ASCOT and, and about the project to um, secure a funding grant and we've been able to employ a community connections coordinator. So that person's um, job role will be to um, increase social participation and involvement within the community for, for people that we support across the organisation. They will also be looking at um, developing positive, or policy and, and guidance um, around social care and, and, and how you can increase community connections um, for people um, who face social inclusion. So again, that was one of the really positive things um, that we were able to use our findings in order to secure funding. In terms of control, um, we're really looking at our processes again um, and making sure that for individuals who haven't yet completed the life management process, that um, we're really looking at control and how we can support them to have more control of their lives through those processes. Individuals would have a perfect week. Um, they have their reviewed support planners and there was matched up to people's choices so that they have more control over, over the support. Um, we've also looked at communication as well um, and how we communicate the, the, the Life I Want project to um, the people that we support so that they fully understand that um, they can change their minds and, and it's it's their choice over, over the support that they want and, and we will meet work to meet their needs and um, they don't have to work to meet our needs. And also then in terms of occupation, um, through the person-centred outcomes that we um, decide and, and work together to, to formulate during the Planning Live event, um, we're also helping people look at reciprocal relationships um, to help individuals identify um, what their role is and what their purpose is in life. Um, so that's, that's something else that's positive about this. So future uses of ASCO as well. Um, we are beginning to look at incorporating ASCOT into our person-centred review processes um, and, and how we're going to do that on an annual basis. Um, we will complete um, the ASCOT as part of this project again in September just for annual comparison of the data. And we're also looking at exploring the carers version of ASCOT to evaluate the impact of our family services on carers' social care related quality of life. So we've, we've lots, of, um, lots of exciting things in the pipeline. And just to finalise then, so how can ASCOT um, be used to measure impact and how can it benefit service providers? Well, it's really helped us improve our service delivery. We've very clearly been able to identify areas where, where we can um, improve on support for the people that we support. Um, it supports staff to become more energised, so um, certainly our staff have been very positive about, um, about the tool and using the tool. And it gives them, you know, that they, they can very clearly see the areas of where they need to improve their work as well. And, and it gives them a united goal to, to work towards. As I said, we've been lucky. It's provided evidence for areas of funding and investment. And it evidences why people should use our services. And it also helps identify um, support needs, so areas where we can help individuals with future support planning in order to um, live the life that they want. 
So thank you very much for listening and um, if you have any questions I'm, I'm more than happy to, to try to answer them and if you have any questions um, beyond today my email address and contact details are on the screen you're, you're very welcome to um, give me a call or drop me an email. Thank you. Thank you Gemma very much for that, that was very interesting. Um, any questions from anyone please raise your hand now and I will come to you in turn. No, doesn't look like anything. I don't know if um, Camilla or any other members of the ASCOT team want to make any comment at this point. Um. I just wanted to say, it's Anne-Marie here, I just wanted to say thank you to Gemma, I found that really fascinating and it's really good to hear the perspective from sort of staff and providers as well as from the people that have been involved in sort of planning the life they want with with your services. I think that was really interesting to see. Um, so yes, thank you very much for giving such positive feedback. Not a problem, thank you for the opportunity. Great, well looks like there are no questions for Gemma, so once again thank you very much. Um, I will now switch presenter to Trisha Capes and Brian Goodwin. Bear with me. Hi Tricia and Brian, you should now have the microphone, so over to you guys. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, my name is Tricia Capes and I work for Essex County Council. And um, with me I have Brian. Yeah, good morning. I'm Brian Goodwin and I work for the Rural Community Council of Essex. And we're going to talk about um, community agents in Essex and the use of ASCOT to support impact measurement. Just having trouble with my presentation, hold on a moment. It's not going through. Okay, so it, is that working for everybody now? Um, okay, so um, we're going to talk about um, background to community agents. Um, and the need to prove the case. Um, we're going to then talk a bit about um, it, the embedding the measure and how we did that through training um, and give some details about the progress we've made um, and feedback we've had so far from the agents using the measure um, and then take you through what we're going to do next. Right, so what I'll do is I'll give you a bit of a background. Uh, obviously it's going to be very brief uh, given the time scale. Um, Community Agents Essex was born out of a previous project which was uh, called Village Agents, um, which was aimed at sort of connecting with people in more rural, more isolated parts of Essex. Um, but Community Agents Essex is now very much focused on older adults, uh, obviously more vulnerable and isolated older people, and, and helping them to get connected. It's delivered by a partnership of four organisations. Uh, I'm the, I work for the Royal Community Council. Uh, we are the lead partner in this, so we have an agreement with Essex County Council to deliver this. And our other partners were chosen because of what they could uh, help with uh, as part of this. The British Red Cross, um, we found are very good for crisis support and, and very good at working and training and, and uh, recruiting volunteers. Uh, AGK Essex has a really good network of um, uh, voice volunteers which attend clubs and groups and they could be a sort of um, a way of engaging with people at a club and group level. And Essex Neighbourhood Watch uh, has somewhere over 5,000 small coordinator groups and, and we felt they would be ideal for connecting with people at a street level. So, uh, I mean, our main aim is to um, get to meet older people in their own homes so that we can get a good idea of uh, how they are living and to then look at ways that could help them to live independently uh, in a better way, really. Um, it is person-centred, so we try to sort of guide them through a process which Trisha, Trisha will talk about um, in a minute. Um, we take referrals from social care, uh, we take referral, about half of our referrals to go and meet older people uh, come from social care. 
The rest either come from some form of health source or from our own outreach, either at that club, community sort of level or at a street level. Um, our aim is is to meet with a person to get um, a look at you know their house, their living conditions in a way to talk them through what they might be struggling with um, because at the end of the day um, what we want to do is to get communities and individuals more resilient individually. Uh, we um, are in Essex it's a big place uh, we are covering the whole of Essex. Um, I don't know how many square miles it is, but uh, there's about 1.4 million people live in, uh, live in Essex. Our aim is to try and see 500 new clients a month. So it's, in a way, it's very high volume um, because we've, we've got 33 uh, agents that go out and do the initial visits. And uh, each of those agents is only working uh, part time, probably about 15 hours a week which in effect gives us about four hours with every new client uh, and that has to, to go through you know, an, an identification of what they could really be, be helped with and also look at um, the other wider sort of support that they could get from, from individuals. Um, obviously what we need to do um, because you can do some really great things uh, but unless you can prove it nobody will ever learn from it nobody will ever you know, understand uh, what you can do we uh, are looking particularly um, to demonstrate to our uh, to, to Essex County Council that what we do saves them money by way of fewer assessments uh, that they have to do themselves uh, we are looking to, uh, for, through getting people to help themselves and to help one another, uh, to hopefully reduce the number of low-level care packages that the County Council has to put in place. And uh, at the end of the day, if people are living uh, healthier and happier independently, then uh, hopefully we would be um, delaying any entry into residential care. So it is very much focused now on providing uh, the County Council social care in, in a way uh, with some direct savings. So it's a new way of working. It's an alternative to traditional social care in, in, in a sense. We work with um, a system where we can record things. And the four things that we are um, really looking to, to report on, obviously we have a whole host of data about the client and then we have a whole host of data about what we do for that client. Um, through that process we record every time that we speak to a client or um, when we, you know, that can be by phone or by visit or could be some form of drop-in session. And through the same process we are also then looking to get the individuals to set their own goals. Um, we're looking at sort of one or two goals which are particularly, you know, um, sensitive to that person. And then alongside that, uh, on our system, we can ask the series of ASCOT questions um, at any visit. Um, we do, at the moment, we tend to do it at the first visit and we have plans to do it at various stages further on, which we'll, we'll come on to. Um, and to validate all of this data, what we're then doing is a selection of case studies so that we then uh, do a more detailed uh, interview with the agent generally um, to find out what the person's presenting need was and how we have helped that person. Uh, so that's a combination of the, the data. The goals to some extent are, are a fairly sort of short-term immediate assessment of what we've done for the person and I think what we're seeing for Ascot that is uh, more the longer term journey um, because our aim is to compare start and finish. I'm going to hand you back to Tricia now. Okay. Yes, so um, one of the um, biggest challenges out of those things um, was the ASCOT. So generally um, the recording of data, you know, the usual things like who they are, where they are, all, um, all of that kind of information um, is generally something easy to understand. Um, the case studies also was something we knew that we could work out along the way to um, provide um, evidence that um, people were avoiding things such as um, residential care, things that are traditionally cost lots of money, 
um, especially if they're not self-funding. Um, and so all of those things we generally felt were would be would be easier than um, ASCOT. So um, we were aware that there may be some training needed, um, and the one of the major challenges with this project was obviously that RCCE and the other partners are grant funded, um, so they're not um, given a contract like other providers, um, and essentially they are self-sufficient and um, there was not a lot of money to um, have training um, delivered by external organisations, so um, we agreed that we would set about developing some training that would support our third and voluntary sector partners to embed this measure. So I'm just going to take you through um, briefly about the training and what, what it involved. So we had um, a starter exercise where we asked um, agents what their experience of measuring impact was and how that was, and that hoped to demonstrate and, and did demonstrate um, that they all had different ways of uh, measuring it and that um, it may be just because someone has told them, um, it may be they can tell because visually someone is happy, um, but essentially they all had different ways and we needed a measure that would enable them to have a um, consistent way of doing it, but also wouldn't get in the way of the, their everyday job of helping people to um, meet their, um, get be involved in their communities. Um, we then talked people through the measure and um, talked about how it, it um, had been developed. Um, we then um, got the agents to do an exercise where they used the measure just cold as if they were asking each other through um, a survey question um, to, to let them uh, see the difference between that um, and what it would be like to have a structured conversation. We then role played um, having a structured conversation um, and uh, role modelled that to them with a practical example um, which we had a pre-planned script for uh, which was based on an ideal um, situation if everything went to plan um, and we then had um, an exercise where we um, got the agents to um, develop some prompts and uh, clues and observations and this was um, influenced by some of the um, work that had been done with ASCOT for people with a learning disability uh, where you would rely on observations to, to uh, make an assessment of ASCOT. But the idea here is that they would use those observations and those clues to find a way in to ask the questions. Um, so if someone was talking about the fact that their, their relative was taking control over things, um, that, that would give them a way in to introduce that question around choice and control. Um, we then um, undertook a ratings exercise um, where we came up with um, different ratings for each of the um, ASCOT areas um, and this was obviously based on the guidance um, that we found very useful um, and um, the idea of doing it doing this was to ensure that the agents were consistently rating and to encourage them to talk to each other when they're out in the field if they are unsure how to rate something or um, the, the older person isn't sure you know how to answer a question that they would um, have a consistent way to overcome that. And following the training um, agents were then provided with a guidance pack and frequently asked questions uh, which was informed by the questions both in the training and some other key things that we wanted to make sure the agents were or were not doing. The main one being around people um, with a high level dementia, if someone was caring for someone with dementia, um, if it was clearly obvious that they couldn't undertake um, ASCOT, was to encourage them to use it with the carer um, and also if both the carer and the person they were caring for, um, if ASCOT was relevant then they would do ASCOT with both people. Um, agents were then provided with a template which would help them um, in the field 
which included the prompts that they'd come up with during the training. And they were then asked um, to provide some informal feedback and their initial experiences of using ASCOT. Um, they've been using ASCOT since January. Yeah, February, really. Fe yeah. Fe January, February. Um, and um, I'm now going to pass you back to Brian, who's going to talk you through um, some of the how things have been going and the feedback we've had. Yeah, so I mean, we've we've been trying to get them uh, working on the initial um, set of questions, really. So this is integrated, as Trisha has said, into their first meeting of the client, and this is done before we identify uh, things that we can do either ourselves or that other organisations can do to support that person. Um, I think we've managed to very successfully integrate it in, in, in that, and that is, I think, in a big part due to the to the training and to the form that we've used. Um, I think that uh, there are some concerns about um, the uh, length of time that it takes to use the ASCOT, but um, I think the agents will get better at that. Um, all, uh, and what we're finding now, we've got about 660 uh, cases where we have now asked those first questions, um, but to be fair, this is very much a work in progress because we've only got 34 uh, where they've gone back and asked the same questions. Now, at the moment, we're using the agents to do this, and I think we might have to find another way around that, but where we have gone back, um, generally about six to eight weeks after, or, or could be longer, depending upon the complexity of a person's situation, uh, we are getting some very positive results from the individual. So this is you know, a person's view of um, how their life has changed in a way by asking the same set of questions. And out of the 34 uh, that we have asked at close, only one has, has been a slight negative, which was about, it was 0 0.0 one or something, it was very small. Um, 30 have been positive and three have actually just not moved at all. Um, so I think uh, we've still got some work to go to get this really integrated into uh, you know our processes. Um, and I think that there is a nervousness from the agent sometimes that the client might be uh, sort of less inclined to answer the questions at the end because they've got what they wanted in the first place, that's it, they're moving on now. Um, so I think that there is a challenge for us there to, to, to get it embedded in what we do. But I think there is a real value because what we have to do is, is to, to demonstrate the funding. Um, we've really got to be able to, to demonstrate that we've had an impact uh, which we can probably do from the goals and from the data, but we need to demonstrate how long that impact lasts for, um, because obviously that has a huge effect on on what uh, you know traditional statutory measures might have cost compared to what we're doing in in the third what well, the community and voluntary sector. So it is very much a learning process. Um, we we do think it's very. Um, you know, promising in what it can do. Uh, I think the trick is to really integrate it into um, uh, our, our processes and to make sure that um, the way that we do it um, is valuable because um, obviously you could spend far more time monitoring than you actually spend doing the job, but actually without the monitoring, uh, you can't demonstrate that you've done a good thing. Uh, so we, we you know we're very mindful of that balance uh, and if anybody has any ideas about how to to make that you know uh, as low cost as possible to but to get the most impact out of it I think you know we'd be keen to understand that um, so and the other thing I mean we are looking at whether we, there might be alternative ways of, of actually getting the information because what we want to do is, is, is as we said earlier is do it over a much longer period of time sort of three months six months twelve months after the close of the case for a person um, so we're looking at alternatives and possibly the use of volunteers to come in and do that but obviously then there's this issues around consistency which we'd have to work through so I'm just going to hand you back to Tricia just in case I've missed anything here, but uh, I think we think it's got great potential. Um, we've just really got to 
work smarter and refine how we use it. So we're open to suggestions. Yeah, so um, in terms of um, looking at the um, scores both before and after for uh, the same uh, people that have had ASCOT completed, um, initial statistics are showing that that, that is a significant difference um, and um, that's really promising, um, but obviously it's only on those 34 cases. Um, and um, the idea of going forwards as well is to uh, review the um, actual measure um, through focus groups and maybe interviews or a combination of both. Um, and part of that may involve um, addressing the difference between ASCOT and the goals that they um, focus on. Um, because agents are sometimes um, not being able to understand the difference between what ASCOT is doing and what the goals are. So the goals of traditionally are just physical things that they want to achieve and ASCOT is around the outcomes that they want to achieve. Um, yeah, so essentially that's it and if, if uh, the it may be that we, um, as Brian said, do it through <coughs> alternative means um, that agents are given more time but there's be funding implications for that. Um, <coughs> or whether they do it on f fewer cases um, or stop doing it on all of the cases. Um, the focus being maybe on the cases where there is a higher need. Um, perhaps the person would be going into residential care if they weren't getting this support. Um, so any ideas welcome. Um, and that's the end of our presentation. Thank so you very, very much. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you'd all gone. Yeah. <laughs> no, still here. Um, are there any questions from anyone? I'm looking for any hands going up. I can't see any. Uh, I've no. got a question, Ed. Okay, Anne-Marie, over to you. Hi, Hi Tricia. Hi, Brian. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, I just wanted to ask whether, um, a little bit more of a follow-up question actually on the points that you made um, about how the ratings are being made by um, the people going in and are doing these sort of assessments if you like. It sounded like you were using an ASCOT interview version, so maybe something like INT4, but that then you weren't treating it as an interview, that you were sort of doing some sort of ratings, which seemed like a combination of the care homes approach and the interview approach. I just wanted if you could explain that a little bit further so we can understand how you're using the tools. Yeah, so we have had to adapt it slightly for communication. Um, detract from um, the nature of what happens when an agent approaches the home. So they will go in and um, the person, um, you know, it's it's like, um, oh, wonderful, you're here, and they want to talk to them almost straight away. So we are aware that sitting down with them and doing a, um, a, a ASCOT as a, as a self-completion tool, um, so the SSC... Um, for would not necessarily be appropriate at that point. Um, so we adapted that and combined it, as you say, with the interview version um, and wanted to make sure that the agent didn't discuss any goals or um, any um, how they would address their needs before they had finished having the conversation. So the agent wouldn't have had any impact at all other than being there, obviously, um, and, uh, until the uh, they wouldn't discuss any um, how they're going to address aims until they had um, got through ASCOT. And so it would be a combination of using um, what the person is saying to them to ask the questions. And yes, it means that the questions may not be asked exactly in the order that they appear uh, normally in the survey version. So we have, I suppose, been a little bit naughty there. <laughs> Uh, but, um, it, yeah. it was necessary to, for, for the, for the um, project. And from my point of view, I mean, it has to be affordable and therefore we are looking for the whole completion of the question set to not add any more than 20 minutes to what um, an agent would normally do with an individual. 
uh, and I'd like to think we could probably get it down to, to slightly less than that because obviously you know we're trying to see high numbers with with very well with restricted resources I mean let's be honest I mean you know from from where we sit in the community and voluntary sector everybody wants you know things done more efficiently lower cost um, but I do see a value to it so it's not that we don't want to do it we just want to make it a really integrated part of the process yeah mm -hmm. so um, they may um, the, the, the essentially the training reinforced that they must use what the person says um, not not their own um, subjective view of the person so it's, it is a kind of in between an interview uh, observation and um, the self completion tool in the sense that it's what the person says um, in response um, that is taken as the answer. Does that and are you sense? are you just asking current social care? So just the eight questions. Um, yeah, just the eight questions because we felt repeating the the, the dignity question would be too complicated. <laughs> That's fine. No, I just I'm surprised it's taking so long because I th I would expect that to only take five minutes maybe at the start of a to ask those eight questions to sort of say before we begin I just want to ask you some uh, quick few questions to help us make an assessment of your needs and then ask those eight questions. I just wondered if you tried doing it that way. I, I think uh, you've got to bear in mind that we're dealing with isolated and vulnerable older people you know 35 percent of the people that we see are over the age of 80 uh, so um, it, it actually you know you have to go through the process almost in some form of easy to understand way um, because you know and in a way we also need to bear in mind that the people that have contacted us it's probably a big step for them to, to mm. sort of put their hand up and say actually I think I need a bit of help because older people are very proud I'm, I'm sure you understand this and they do put up lots of barriers to you know why they could actually have some help and why you know maybe other people are more in need than they are um, so we have to be very careful about how we approach it because our whole process is based on getting a, a very good relationship with this person very quickly uh, so that they will open up uh, and therefore we can help them in a much wider sense um, not only from what they say to us but obviously what we spot um, but uh, so so if the, the if the older person they might jump they might jump straight in and, and start talking about their problems straight away um, and so the agent may not get a chance to sit down it may be that they um, they ask them if they want a cup of tea as soon as they walk in the door and um, they're so pleased to see someone um, and um, it's difficult to then say oh could we just sit down here and do these questions mm. in fact they probably wouldn't answer them if you went through a formal process then they'd probably they'd, they'd probably feel that that wasn't going to do for them what they wanted it to do for them mm. yeah. they wouldn't necessarily see the relevance between the domains being asked and their immediate issue no yeah. they wouldn't that's yeah. exactly yes, yes I understand Yes. Yeah, I understand that. I think that I think that's also something that's quite difficult about evaluating short-term or low-level interventions. That, are, that rather than these big, you know, big, oh, we've got home care going in for X amount of hours per week, or we're going into residential care, or you're receiving a personal budget, which is a more distinct entity, isn't it? I think in terms of the evaluation. Um, so I think it's raised some really important and interesting issues and I think you've used ASCOT in a really innovative way and I think other people will find it really helpful to hear how you've used it and the issues that you've come up against. So thank you very much for that. Okay, and we do have um, a copy of the um, role, I can give you a copy of the role modelling um, exercise um, which kind of demonstrates how it would be used in an ideal situation and it was very short because obviously it was being done in a training session but it the reality of that would be that you know it's a it's a five ten minute role model um, with with myself and one of the other trainers um, but they, <coughs> they that, that may that conversation all the way through may take them two hours because um, the, the older person will go off on a tangent talking about something completely different um, mm -hmm. and then they have to draw them back in and, and, and get them to um, complete it that way. So. Mm, yes, yes, we, we've found similar things in residential care services so I can, yeah. appreciate, I can appreciate where you're coming from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. 
and in a, in a, some you know in a way you have to understand what the person is telling you and and uh, sometimes what you might hear um, isn't necessarily correct because you'll find out later that they start repeating themselves and obviously all the the things around you know minor cognitive impairment and and uh, you know that it's when you've only just met a person you know there's a lot to take into account um, mm. in that sense yeah 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 that's really helpful okay. I'm not sure if there's any other questions Ed has anyone else raised their hand nothing else but if anyone does have any questions do raise your hand now before we move on to the next presentation nope that looks like it's it so thank you both very much Trisha and Brian Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. And we will, if I can press the right buttons, Julie and Phil, you now have the screen, and if you just want to unmute yourselves, you then have the microphone too. Is that okay? Everyone hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. You're quite quiet, but that should be okay. And is the screen coming? Screen, we can just see you loading up PowerPoint, and you're a bit clearer now as well. It should be loaded. Let me know when it's loaded. That's brilliant. Okay, well, over to you both. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, and good almost afternoon. Um, I suppose. Our presentation is going to echo uh, a lot of what the uh, Positive Futures presentation was, that we're a lot earlier in our journey and that uh, we're not long engaged on a personalization agenda within the organization and we're two years into it. Um, just wait for this. I can't see what you can see, so I'll wait till the uh, screen loads up. The, uh, oh, there's many reasons that we, we chose the ASCOT tool in to use in the way that we're planning on using it, and I'll go into how we plan to use it, but first I'd like to just touch on why it is that we we chose to use this particular tool and, and sort of what alternatives we considered. Um, but part of our process was we had an outdated, really old-fashioned uh, care and support planning system across our organization and um, that was uh, really not effective in, in doing anything other than keeping people safe and well. It certainly wasn't person-centered and it didn't reflect a lot of choice or uh, control or elements of personal outcomes which really uh, didn't meet our organizational strategy or the, the new agendas laid out in the CARE Act uh, and in the uh, Chloe in Scotland. So we looked at a large number of, of frameworks, really the same ones as, uh, as what um, Positive Futures looked at, the Outcome Star and uh, the health and wellbeing frameworks and just it, it wasn't quite fitting with the process of how we wanted to implement it with a with an assessment, a review, um, and an evaluation of our pro our process really is how it needed to fit in. And um, we also wanted a system that linked quite closely with the descriptors in the Care Act and what we were able to do with the outcomes uh, measures in the ASCART was correlate them up to being fitting into the Care Act wellbeing descriptors which allowed us to demonstrate uh, not just compliance with the Care Act but also working towards those, those domains. Um, the other reason that we, we chose to use ASCOT is that it, it, during its development it had consulted with people who use services and other experts to make sure that the, the aspects of the social care related quality of lives were chosen by the people who use services and um, relevant to social care interventions which is crucial to us and because a lot of the outcome frameworks that we'd looked at didn't quite touch all the bases that we needed it to and it's the, the tools diversity and it, its availability to be used on anyone that we support and we support a range of people with age-related needs uh, limb disabilities mental health needs children's services and so it needed to be able to be scoped across all of those services and um, so that we could use it as, as our one tool rather than having multiple tools within, a, within an organization that, that could complicate or um, create different scores for different people which would, would which again would cause confusion and we needed it to be able to be used as a quality tool, a benchmarking tool and if we could find something that we could integrate into 
assessments, review, and quality benchmark, and then we've really uh, reached the holy grail of, of sort of assessment tools, which we think uh, we have been able to. And that can help us either on an individual level, evaluating an individual support, a service if we needed to do a deeper dive, even regional and organisational levels of, um, of how well-being is um, depicted across the organisation. So we had to figure out a plan of how we wanted to use the ASCOT domains in our documents. This is uh, this is the process that we're going through now. I'm um, going through a pilot process with new support planning, which uses the descriptors uh, in the ASCOT tool for our, our care planning descriptors about how we plan and support people. Uh, and we're doing that along with Helen Sanderson, uh, similar to Positive Futures, with a person-centered approach and using person-centered thinking tools. But so being able to adapt the tool to be used in our support planning helps us to be able to use it later on to benchmark the quality of this care and support. Um, we're also now looking at integrating it into our assessment so that we can, uh, uh, before we start supporting a person or just, just before we start supporting a person, we can see what their level of needs are and their opinion or their, uh, their, 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 what their opinion is of their current presentation. And then we're able to use that to look back either six weeks, six months, or 12 months down the line to, to actually find out the, the, the gain of what we're doing. And if it does have a positive impact on their life, hopefully we'll find that it does. Um, and we wanted to use the same domains throughout all of our documents so that we have a really, really consistent approach to um, assessing quality. of. And by quality, I mean that's, you know, the effectiveness and the impact of what we're doing, making sure that what we're doing does reflect what the person needs and what the person wants, which is uh, our most important thing. The key benefits that we found for using this tool, what we've got to decide on, um, with internally we've got to provoke proposals to the board and get moving on actually implementing it and piloting it, um, is that the tools that we've got within our care planning process does lend itself to being able to be benchmarked and audited using the ASCOT tools. And the, the diversity and the range of ASCOT tools help us be able to do that across all of our sites. CH3 for some of our bigger sites and even down to the uh, self-assessments are really crucial for uh, being able to capture people um, before they come into us and people that have got uh, high levels of cognition and ability. The other part is that um, the, out of all of the tools that we looked at, the ASCOT tool was probably the only framework we felt would would meet all of those needs that we have. When when we put it together with our own process that we've been working with Helen Sanderson on, it, it wasn't without too much molding and changing. We do have to stick to something consistent, and we, we needed something that could fit in with us rather than us have to completely change our agenda to fit in with uh, the tool. And um, through our training, we found out how, how widely evidence-based and recognised by local authorities, and particularly the local authorities that we work with across the country. Uh, there isn't, there hasn't been one yet that don't know about ASCOT or that haven't, that haven't used or had some input with it in the, in the past. And uh, we've spoke to CQC about it locally, especially the Manchester services, and they, and they, uh, they are positive about the use of ASCOT, which offers us a level of credibility and being able to demonstrate that our new process of planning support for people, which is completely revolutionary for our organisation, does have a positive impact. Because um, what we need to demonstrate is that our approach, our person-centred approach, because we're designing it from, from scratch for us as an organisation, that it does improve and positively impact the people who support quality of life. And uh, there's no other way for us to do that other than to have a recognised benchmarking tool to be able to, to assess that. And quite fundamentally as well, a lot of the tools in the ASCOT um, toolkit does involve the actual people we support and their families and friends in the assessment of the quality of our services and isn't driven by, by us. It isn't us assessing the quality of our support and delivery of services, but it's actually the people that are supported by them, which is, um, which is key for us in being able to understand uh, the person supported perspective on our support, which is quite different than most of the other tools which rely on a professional input or a, 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 sometimes supposition from, a, from the people providing the support to that person on whether that meets their needs, whether they're doing well, 
uh, this is, allows us a fresh approach on being able to ask from a different perspective, which is really powerful. I think um, for us, there's some key next steps in that we've got to evaluate our current pilot of care and support planning, which does use the ASCOT domains uh, for planning and, plan and care and support, and build on that into our review and assessment process to make sure that we um, do have consistent use of the la specifically the language, but also the, the domains, and then um, retest it. Once that's been retested, and if we find that it's been successful, we then go to our next stage, which would be a proposal to the board to implement it across the organisation, which means implementing it over 450 sites from Scotland all the way down to Portsmouth, which is an absolutely enormous task, but something we're, we're, we're keen on being able to, to do, provided that it does demonstrate that it's able to meet our objectives and our needs. Um, I did make this presentation quite quick because I think uh, Positive Futures did touch on the majority of the stuff that we have found as well. And it is also it's uh, interesting to understand that another organisation has gone through a very similar process and come to very much the same conclusions that we have completely independently of each other, which does also show the scope and power of the tool itself. So, thank you. And if there's any questions, uh, please let us know. Thank you both very much. Um, any questions, please raise your hands now or send them in through the chat window. And again, I don't know if uh, Camilla or Anne-Marie want to add anything to this or any questions. Hi, hi Phil, it's Anne-Marie here. I can't hear you, but hopefully you can Are you okay? still. Hi, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I can. I, I don't know if there's any questions coming up. I feel a bit of a fraud asking questions as I know quite a lot about what you're doing. Let me just come to Connor Duffy. Connor, you should be able to speak now. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Connor Duffy. I'm from the Health Hello. and Social Care Board here in Northern Ireland. And my question just very quickly is just about your use of ASCOT at the assessment process. And yeah. what I'm just trying to ask is how easy did you find integrating ASCOT into the assessment process because we are at the very, very early stages of implementing ASCOT, but we are also in the position that we also are required to use what's called ENISAT and it's a single assessment tool that all social care services in Northern Ireland have to use. So what, we're, what I'm just trying to find out is how easy did you find implementing ASCOT in the assessment and was it used as a standalone tool in itself or did you integrate it into one of your own systems? So I think um, the, we're so early in stages at the moment that we haven't actually developed the final uh, assessment tool. However, um, there are, we have been put in touch with uh, Cumbria by Anne-Marie, who have developed a, an assessment tool for people being supported by their health and care services in, in Cumbria, which we're very keen on expanding on and integrating. Uh, I think they've used the SCT4 to um, create an assessment and added bits that are relevant to their organisation to it so that it does become integrated, but it does ask the same questions. And it doesn't necessarily need to be for us the SCT4. I think that's probably the best tool to use. Um, but I think from from a private organ from an organization's perspective like ourselves, uh, because we are able to just implement this and we are at the at the point of being able to completely redevelop our assessment, care plan and support and review process, it, we have much more flexibility in being able to do so. But there are going to be have to be additions that we that we need to make, such as health and finance, that aren't covered by the ASCOT tool. That we need to be very careful about how we add those to make sure that they remain consistent, but also so that they don't. That we can't obviously we can't use ASCOT to benchmark those outcomes. We'd have to figure out a different tool to be able to do that. Uh, so, hopefully that answers your question. No, it does. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Connor. Um, I'm just going to unmute Trisha again, who I can see has a question. Um, Trisha, you should be able to speak now. Um, yeah, so um, two things really. It was interesting to um, hear about um, the fact that you had strong support for it 
for, for using Ascot. Um, and I'm just wondering, two parts really, um, if there was anyone that you um, had any difficulty convincing internally. Um, and also, um, I was just listening to what you were saying about finance um, and how Ascot perhaps might not. Um, um, and for us, the, um, we are using the case studies to help convince finance. So we are calculating how much the people might cost um, if they had not had um, if they had not had a community agent. Um, what would have happened to them, and compare that to what did happen to them. So um, rather long question, but. <laughs> Um, I think for who who do we have to convince internally? I think we have the challenges. We have to convince everybody internally. A massive organisation. There's a lot of key stakeholders that, that need to buy into this. Uh, some things help with that. Is that we've already recognised that our current system is outdated, and that we need to make improvements. And the second thing is that because Ascot, in our research and our going to the training and speaking to other people and other um, other providers and also our commissioners, because it's so widely recognised and accepted, we've had much more success in being able to um, not necessarily convince, but explain to the to the directors and to the trustees and people who need to know um, why this is the right way, the right direction to go. Um, I think half the battle was won when we recognised there is an issue and that we do need to move forward, and the Care Act does dictate. Uh, quite clearly that we need to make changes to how we do things. I think from I just meant just the point about finances, I meant the ASCOT tool wasn't able to benchmark someone's outcome in respect of finances, specifically around individual budgets and individual service funds or how they manage their day to day rather than what the financial challenges inside. Obviously there's a cost associated with ASCOT, but there's also kind of a cost associated with implementing a new care and support plan. But because we've invested in doing that, we can combine everything together without any additional um, fiscal costs, so to speak, other than the training and, and any other additional support we need. Okay, thank you. I didn't know whether it's Anne Marie here. I didn't know whether uh, Gemma would like to add anything uh, to any of these points because I know that Positive Futures have, have already sort of done a little bit more work around this. Um, I don't know whether you've got anything, Gemma, that you might like to add to any of the questions that have come up. Um, no, I think I've, you know, I think Phil answered the questions very well there. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we seem to be a wee bit further ahead in terms of the process where we're starting to embed the ASCOT tool within our um, review processes. And I think it would be good, actually, um, one of your colleagues, Phil, has emailed me already, so I've forwarded on my contact details. Um, I, I certainly think it would be good to, to have a conversation after um, today and, and we can share some learning around that. Yeah, that sounds really sensible. I think, I think that's what we should be aiming to do. I think the, the way that um, everybody that's spoken today is using ASCOT is what we would consider quite innovative, really, and you're, you're doing some groundbreaking work with the ASCOT Toolkit by integrating it into a sort of care planning assessment and review in your respective organisations. And I think that um, we're getting increasing uh, interest not only from the UK but also internationally in using ASCOT in this way. So I think you know any sort of mutual support that can be given and you know, mutual learning that can be shared like through venues like this but also from one-to-one -one conversations I think will be useful for lots of people. Um, so, I mean, hopefully the slides at the very least of these presentations will be available online afterwards for people to refer to. Um, and obviously people can come to us if they have any further questions and hopefully we can be a bit of a go-between. Um, one other thing that I thought might be worth mentioning is if you go onto the ASCOT website to the references section, under ASCOT applications in the references list, you will find um, a research policy and planning article that was published by Louise Johnson, who's based at Cumbria County Council, about their experience of using ASCOT in assessment review. And I think they came up against issues around training and getting staff on board with using it and, and so on. And so um, if any organisations are thinking of using it in that way and want a, a reference that they can use, because obviously evidence such as that is, is difficult to find, um, then, then just look at our website for, for further information.
Great, thank you everyone. Um, before I hand back to Camilla to, to wrap up, um, are there any final questions to, to any of the um, speakers today or to the ASCOT team? And if so, do raise your hand now. Um, no, looks good. Um, I would just like to say thank you all very much. Um, thank you for patience with technology. I think this has worked quite well. Um, would welcome any feedback, suggestions from anyone, um, as hopefully this is a uh, form of technology we can use a bit more. Um, and I will now hand back to Camilla just to bring things to a close. So I just wanted to say um, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you to all the speakers for your very interesting presentations. And like Anne-Marie said, if there are any questions, please do send us an email and we'll try to forward them to the relevant person. And once again, thank you and um, that's it. So. Thanks.